Good morning, I hope everyone's doing well. I wish, wish to wish you a very happy Father's Day today for those who are with us this morning and those who are watching in, online. Um, you know, it's it really... Oh, thank you. You know, and it's, and it's really neat because, you know, it's a special day, you know, for fathers. And I, I rather enjoyed it, enjoy it a lot because... Um, That's okay. Um, usually for Father's Day, I'm at Christian Youth in Action Camp, right? And the kids always have a, a special thing for me. The, you know, the, working with kids for years, the kids always ask me, what's your name? And I tell them, Mr. Sanchez. And they said, no, what's your first name? See, and I'm old school. I, I don't need kids to be my friends. I'm there to mentor them, not to be their buddies, all right? So, you know, Mr. Sanchez. I say, no, what's your first name? And they try to look at my badge, because I had, you know, a school badge. That was on the school board, so I had my school badge. But I had them take my name off, and they put Mr. Sanchez. And uh, the, kid would look, the kid would look at my badge and say, Mr., is that your first name? I go, yeah, my first name is Mr., and then Sanchez is my last name. So that went on for a while, and then, you know, eventually the kid started calling me dad. They called me Mr. Dad. And I'm, I'm like, the, you know, and it's a badge, for me it's a badge of honor because I earned that. You know, there's no one else in, in all of Grandview or the places that we've been where I've heard a kid call somebody Mr. Dad. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's touching. And those kids call me, you know, when, when uh, Christian Youth in Action Camp, I think it was the, probably the first one I went to, Nikki was a teenager, and I was training these, these teenagers to how to share the gospel and stuff, and Nikki was talking to this one kid, and he goes, she goes, uh, welcome to the family. He goes, what? He goes, she goes, you understand at the end. And at the end, he, he says, I understand. And that kid, you know, that was like, wow. That was a long time ago. But he, he's, he has his own family now and stuff like that, and he still calls me dad, messages me and say, hey, dad, how are you doing, and stuff. So, you know, my kids always figured, when I say my kids, I have my own personal kids, and then I have all my, all my kids. And uh, I love, I love all, all my personal kids, and I love all my kids. So just wanted to share that. We started summer clubs this past Thursday. Our slogan is five days of fun or a summer of growth. Our goal is simple, and that is the teaching of the fundamentals of the faith through the Word of God. By the end of summer, we're seeking to accomplish three things. First, that each child will understand the basic concepts of who God is. The second is that each child would have heard and have an understanding of the basic and total gospel. And lastly, that each child would have a practical understanding and usage of the Bible. They'll be able to open their Bible and, and you, you'll tell them. By the end of the summer, you'll say, uh, you know, like the sword drills. We're talking with Sharon Thursday about sword drills. You can tell them, John 2.15, and the kid will get it. That's what, that's what our goal is at the end of the summer. Please keep our um, leaders in your prayers and their children in prayers. Also that the Lord will grant us blessings that we'll see these fruits by the end of the summer. Now we don't have a lot of kids, right? But the kids we have, I mean, what a blessing. And that's all we seek. And like I said last week, we're looking for one. Right? Our goal is one. We don't need a lot of kids. I, I fell in that trap a long time ago where numbers, we don't need numbers. We need quality. We need quality. And we have those kids that were, were uh, that been the blessing to us. Like um, our little missionary, Ellie. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just been a blessing. Um, I want to mention to you also, Lucy. Um, next Sunday, during Sunday school today, um, we're, we're learning the gospel, and it came up about the, having your name written in the book of life. And didn't mention anything about the part where it says blotting out. So we're going to talk about that next Sunday. So if you're interested, Sunday school starts at 9 o'clock, 
And we'll be there and we'll, we're going to talk about this blotting out of the name. So wanted to mention that. I'd also like to mention that we have some very good friends. Roger and Diana Ward were com coming down to visit us this week. Um, Roger knows how I am. I've known him for over 20 years. He, so he knows that there's always something going on. And the first thing he's asked, he says, hey, Tony, so, so what do you have going on? Because he called when I was at a CEF meeting. And um, the first question that comes out, it always pops out of his mouth, how can I help? How can I help? You need help with anything, how can I help you? So I asked him to share at Bible study on Wednesday night. And I'm really, really, really excited about this. You know, I love Roger, and you know, he's a really good guy. We helped him. We served with him in Mexico. He had a ministry down there with, um, with, oh, I don't remember the name of the missionary. missionary. He's, he's, he's a, I think, he's a little bigger than me, right? He says he's gray haired now. When I knew him, he was blonde haired. He looked like a, he looked like a big old Viking guy. <laughs> and he speaks Spanish, so <laughs> it's really cool. And the connection that I wanted to, you know, if, you, if you're able, come on Wednesday, come and meet him. I think you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy him. He has a good, really good personality and stuff. The connection that we have with, uh, here in Bonanza, he, he's Bob's McKinsey, the pastor over at Ramdro Valley. He's his uncle. You know, so that's kind of cool. So this morning, being Father's Day, Right? I wanted to address something to do with dads. And now with that in mind, I want us to think about how, you know, you'll never know how much something tr you truly believe in until this, its truth or falsehood comes, comes uh, forth. When this thing becomes a matter of life and death, that's when you understand what you really truly believe. And what I mean by this, for instance, I have this rope. Dollar Tree rope. Really good stuff, right? So this rope, it's easy for you to say that and believe that this is a strong rope. It's a long rope. Right? And this, this rope is good. Like say, for instance, if I want to tie something down in the back of, on the top of my car. You know, I've used this. This came out of my car because I used it to tie stuff down. I would unwrap it and use it. I have no problem with that. But then just suppose, right? You need to use this rope to hang across the cliff. That's a bit different. Right? That's when you discover how much you trust this rope. Now, I wouldn't hang from a cliff with this Dollar Tree rope, or it's not a Dollar 25 rope. <laughs> but that's how, we, that's how we discover things and how much we truly trust things. Only when there's risk involved is what, when we really. Tr um, test the realities of our belief. Now, when your child is sick, what pops into your mind? What's your very concern? You don't care about results of tests. You don't care about x-rays, percentages, new medicine, research or protocols, or anything like that. When someone's child is sick, you just want to know one thing. Is my child going to be okay? Isn't this true? At that point, nothing else matters. You just want to know, is my child going to be okay? Everything else is just details. Now this morning, I want us to take a look, of a, look at a situation of a person. The scriptures call, calls him a uh, royal official or a governor, government official or in some, some translations, a nobleman. I'm just going to call him dad. The, fi the story we're going to look at, we find in uh, the book of John, chapter 4, verses 46 to 53. So if you would, let's turn there. 
John 4, 46 to 54. Therefore he came again to Cana, to Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick in Capram. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to, he went to him and began asking him to come down to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son is alive. The man believed the word of, that Jesus spoke to him and went home. And as he was going down, his slaves, his slaves met him, saying that his son was alive. So he inquired of them, the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was the hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son is alive. And he, said, uh, and he himself believed and his entire household. This is again the second sign that Jesus performed when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So in this passage, we see a dad who comes to Jesus. He comes to Jesus at a, at a time of crisis. And through this, ex, uh, this account, we can see the example of a growing faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for the fathers you've placed in our lives, Heavenly Father. Some are, were good examples in our lives, some were bad examples, but things that showed us that we shouldn't do, but we should go a different way. We know, Heavenly Father, you are the father of all, and you are the example of all, and you lead us and guide us through our lives. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, as we go through our lesson this morning, that we would look at the life that was placed in scriptures and see how the, you work in that person's life and how he, that faith grows in that person and how that person reaches out to others. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, for each and every example you placed before us, that you laid before us, that we may grow in, better in you. Bless us this morning. Amen. So when we look at this, in verses 46 and 47, we witness the beginning of a coming to faith. Now this dad, he had a desperate need. His son was sick. And you know, hard times comes to everyone in their lives. None of us are exempt from this difficulty or pain or suffering in this life or in this world. We've all had experiences and those of you who are younger, Remember that as you go through the tough times in your life, you're not the only one. We've all gone through these things. They might be a different situation or the same situation, but because different times bring different situations, believe it or not, there's only the same solution. For each and every one of these things that happen in your life, there's only one solution, as we'll see. So we see this dad. He heard about Jesus. We don't know exactly how he heard or what he heard. We don't know. I mean, all we know is that he heard about Jesus. Could have been that he was a great healer. We don't know. Maybe he heard that he was a great teacher or whatever. All we know for certain is that he had a need. And when it, that need came to his life, he went to the one that he thought was be, would be, be able to help him with his situation. And that was Jesus. Now I want you to understand, this was no simple or easy thing. Jesus was traveling through Galilee. And this dad, well, he was in Capernaum. Let's take a look. Oops. 
Okay, and I like the, I like these pictures. You know, you might have one of these in your Bible. And you know, some of the some of the things I read about this story and stuff, and they're like, yeah, the guy, he went from there to there. Well, that looks pretty easy from Caprium to Cana, right? Pretty easy. You know, one time we were on a road trip, and it's so funny, Nikki. We're in, uh, we were in Montana. Oh, I forgot the name of it. It starts with a B. I forgot the name of it. But, huh? Bozeman, yeah. We were at a, we went, we stopped at a, at a Costco to buy a pizza to eat because we were on a road trip, right? Nine bucks pizza, feed all, the entire family. So we were there, and Nikki was my little navigator. And she's like, Dad, can we go to Yellowstone? It's only this, this far away. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we can go there. <laughs> But, you know, it, you know, see, when you look at this, you're saying, yeah, you know, it's not that far. How far is that? Oops. How far could that be? But, like I said, it's not a very simple thing. When I, I found this map, and I really liked this. This is the road that he would have taken. Not very straight. Whiny, narrowly. You can probably see hills and stuff. In reality, how long would it take him to get there? Not only that, but I mean, you're taking this long trip. Look at this, look at this. You're, you know, there's, what do you call those, like, side backs or what do you call them? Switchbacks. Yeah, switchbacks and stuff like that. I mean, why don't they just, <laughs> you know, just make a straight line, but they have to do all this squiggly stuff all the time. I don't know, road builders. But you, you look at this. If you were a dad, you're walking. Yeah, you're not taking a car, you're not taking the bus. Maybe you had a ch chariot. You can drive there, right? But if he's walking, just imagine. And how tired would you get? So I want you, the, the point is, I want you to understand, this is not a simple thing. This dad had a need. And he was going to do whatever it took to see Jesus. Because he, he had that, you know, you think about that. Look at this. Did he believe that Jesus could heal his son? He had that hope. Otherwise, he, he, why would he take this trip? Why would anyone take that trip if he didn't have to? And it makes me think of those, uh, remember those old Bugs Bunny World War II cartoons? Was this trip really necessary? You know, those little signs. So, one of the books I read, it said it was 18 miles away. And if you think that's not even close itself, you're talking about how this is. It doesn't look far, but it's, it's a far distance. We can really appreciate this. And then you think about, you know, the need to stop, to eat, to drink, to rest. Sometimes we have the mentality of our lives today because everything's pretty easy. Yesterday I took Grace out. We went to Gerber because I've never seen the reservoir, the campground. And then we went all the way to the, um, the lava flows. I mean, one of the lava things was just a big rock. I was like, wow, it's a big rock. <laughs> and then we kept on going. We kept on following the signs until we went to the, the thing way down there with the caves and stuff. Yeah, I mean, we did all that in one trip. Can you imagine walking all that way? That's, that would be, I mean, we don't equate or realize the difficulties of the time. Everything seems easy to us. Now, this dad was a kind of important person. And like I mentioned earlier, he was a government official. He was a per person of importance and prominence. And more, more than likely, he wasn't a person accustomed to asking anyone for anything. He was a guy that gave orders, and it happened. And then you take into account that he was a part of Herod's government. More likely, took part of the corrupt, self-promoting government. Right? Things we see today. 
now being him being a part of this wicked government, how would it look if word got back to those he worked for or worked with that he'd gone down to see this Jesus guy? It probably wouldn't go or look too good for him when people found out. What, they, what would they even be thinking? Hey, you know, he went down to go see Jesus. You know, that guy, that guy that stirs up all that trouble. Yeah, it wasn't something easy for him. And you could be sh assured that this word was going to get back to these people. But this dad, he had a need. This was his son. And you know, he didn't care about what other people might think or say. He went where he thought he could do that, he could get help. And we need to realize, just like this dad did, how very important it is that when, when um, difficult things and times come into our lives, that we take our concerns to the right place, to that, that right person. Please flip to Psalms 121, 1 and 2. When you think of that person you need to go to, who is that? Psalms 121, 1 and 2. says, I will raise my eyes to the mountains. From where will I find, sorry, from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. When something comes into your life, where should you go? This dad, he took his concerns to the only place he knew he could possibly find help. To his only hope. And that was Jesus Christ. See, unfortunately, what happens in people's lives when they encounter difficulties is they seek help for in, from everywhere else except for where they should. You know, they go to self-help books. They're still big sellers. But you know, most people today, they Google. They spend all their time on Google, look, Googling all their answers, their, you know, answers for their questions. They seek it, they're seeking their help in the internet, the wrong places. We hear it all the time, we're in a mental health crisis because of COVID. That's what, I mean, that's what I hear all the time. So they say, you, you know how many, during that time, how many calls Grace and I have received while we're living in the Yakima Valley? Parents calling about their kids being de uh, possessed by demons. Now just imagine, with this so-called crisis, think about how many of these people, these new online mental health specialists or life coaches, have popped up. Google it. Yeah, you'll find it. They're all over the place. They've popped up. You know why? Let's talk about cash. Let's talk about cash. Basically, I mean, really, truthfully, real and truthfully, it's about the cash. That's what we're talking about here. Don't get me wrong. There are some mental health issues out there. My point is, is how many are really getting addressed compared to what's coming down into searching into the wrong places. So this dad heard about Jesus. And what he heard was enough to cause him to seek Jesus in his time of need. This burdened him that beginning of his faith. Then we look at verses uh, 48 and 49. We see that growth that started taking place in him. And that was his, that he had this persistence, this persistent faith. 
When, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply won't believe. The royal official said to him, sir, come down before, before my child dies. He was persistent. He didn't give up. Right? When we first look at this, we, we think and we look and say that Jesus seems like he's pretty harsh with this guy. He didn't seem very nice. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. In this passage before, what do we see? There were crowds who greeted Jesus when he returned. Now, why were these people really there? Were they really there because they were interested and excited to, in seeing Jesus? Or was it about something else? They just wanted to see a show. Right? Maybe get fed in the middle of it. They weren't interested in the truth. The truth is that they, couldn't give, they wouldn't give two cents for Jesus and who he was. It's all about, and it was all about, them seeing something exciting happen. And they wanted to get in on it. Do we, do we witness these things happening today? Yes. And what's happening? What's happening here in this verse? Jesus isn't rebuking a concerned dad. There's a lot of activity going on here. And you know, Jesus loves the children. And he welcomes them. When his disciples try to turn them away, what did Jesus do? What Jesus is doing here in this verse, he is rebuking the looky loos Those people that are just like, they're there. At the same time, you see, he's testing the father's faith. How really interested is he in seeing his son healed? He's persistent. What does that show? The dad answers, come down before my son dies. Does he truly believe that Jesus could heal him? Yes. He's proving it. He's showing that fact. You know, it makes me think about when many of the disciples that followed Jesus turned away, on, turned away from him when they found out what following him really required. And we see this in John 6, 66 to 68. Because he saw that the, his expectations were too high. John 6, 66 to 68. As a result of many of as a result of this, many of the disciples left and would no longer walk with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you do um, you do not want to leave also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Simon Peter got it right. So we see this dad. He was persistent. But what we still see in him is surface faith. Right? It's just surface faith. He was still interested in getting what he could get from Jesus. What was that? That his son be healed. Sadly, there are many today who have that, have that kind of faith. There's those who believe, if I follow Jesus, he will make me healthy, wealthy, or, and wise, or whatever. That's the signs and wonders. The boy's healing was not important, as in important, as his father believing in Jesus, having that saving faith. This dad's 
eternal salvation was at stake. And the dad had to believe to be saved. Right? He believed, but he didn't truly believe. He didn't have that saving faith. He had that surface, surface faith that turns into that saving faith. Then the dad was helping, or he was helped, because he was persist, persistent. This persistence was absolutely necessary in securing the Lord's help. This persistence that he had showed that he really recognized and acknowledged his need. And this, this belief that God can and would help him. Because just think, if this man stopped asking, he would have shown that he really didn't believe that God could answer his prayer. Would he need it? And he would have gave up on God, disbelieving him. But what do we see? This dad didn't allow the Lord's hesitation to stop him. Remember a verse that we looked at a couple weeks ago? Jeremiah 29, 13. This is when, um, during the baptism, we're talking about the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Jesus said to him, go, if your son is alive, or oh, sorry, Jeremiah 29, 13. And if you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. This man, this dad, he was searching for something. He didn't understand yet that he was searching for God. If we seek the Lord, what shall we find? This dad, he was seeking. And what do we see? In John 4:50. Jesus said to him, go, your son is alive. Then the next thing we see, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went home. Jesus almost seems to still be testing the man. He agreed to heal his son, but he didn't go with him like the men asked. What do we see? We see a trusting, obedient faith. The dad believed the words, right? He believed. He entrusted. He placed confidence he thought this to be true, the words of Jesus. See, where in the place where his faith truly begins. And look where it's, where it's taken him. He had the faith in Jesus. Where before he said, come with me, come, you need to come with me. Now he takes his word. He's confident in it. I mean, just see the difference. And you're like, wow, what amazing, just so amazing. He, is, he wanted him to come with him. Yeah, I wouldn't even think that he would want to force him to come. You know, you need to come with me, come. And all of a sudden he's like, I believe you. I know that he's healed. I have that faith. I know that he, you've done it. You know, how different is your life now that you're saved when you know that you've been saved by Christ? You're like, okay, wow, yeah, I'm good. It's just a confidence, it's a joy, it's everything all rolled into one. It's incredible. This is what this father had. This is what we have. 
And if you don't, you should have this. He went on his way. The dad believed Jesus and obeyed him. This was trusting faith, which is an obedient faith. We are told, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? If you really trust the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will obey. Trusting and obeying as they say are the same side of the coin. They go hand in hand. And this belief, trusting and obeying, you can say that you trust or believe, but if you don't obey, guess what? It isn't anything. We keep coming across this in our, in our Wednesday Bible study, this dead faith, right? If you trust but don't obey, it's nothing. You don't really believe. If you believe, then you trust, which would cause you to obey. And if you think about it, this is the very foundation of eternal security. If you are in Christ, you will live your life in Christ, in which your life will be lined up with that trust and obedience in his word. Which brings us to verses 51 to 53. And I really like this. So, 51 to 53. As he went down, sorry, as he was going down, his slave, his slave met him, saying that his son was alive. So he inquired to them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left, fever left him. So the father knew it was the hour which Jesus said to him, your son was alive. And he himself believed in his entire, entire household. So while he's going down, so here he is, he's headed back home and his slaves meet him. And they greet him with wonderful news. And I want you to picture this. What's really going on? Here he's going back, and he meets his slaves that tell him this really good news. But what does he ask? They told him about a son, and look, he knows. He knows about his son already. That's how much confidence he has in, in Jesus' words. He knows he's healed. We hear that seeing is believing. No. In Christianity, it's first believing, then seeing. We as believers are called to act and then look for the Lord's workings and what I find fascinating is that his slaves tell him, oh yeah, yesterday, <laughs> right, yesterday. So this guy, he's with Jesus, telling him, come, come, come. And Jesus tell him, go home and your son's healed. That was yesterday, right? He didn't go straight back home. You know, I can imagine him going to Galilee. He was, his son is dying. Do you think he was just like strolling along? No, he was hurrying along, right? He was like, oh, I gotta get over there. I gotta see Jesus. On the way home, is he hurrying back? Does it seem like he's hurrying back? Yesterday your son was better. Doesn't seem like he was hurrying back to me. He had this calmness about him. He knew 
that his son was healed. He knew that his son was all right. Think about this. He knew his, his son was fine. And you think about whether he was healed or not. The, the guy, the dad, had peace. He had this peace about him. He wasn't hurrying home. He was just going back home. He had this peace about him. Whether his son was healed or not, he had this peace. I'm sure he was excited to go back to see his son, but he knew, he had this trusting faith that Jesus did what he said he would do. And I sense that he had this, he had this calmness. He was just going back. So where does this all close up, out at? And I want you to look back at a few Sundays. When we looked at the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. The result of the salvation as a head of household, right? In Acts 16, 30 to 31. After he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved to you and your household. See, the influence the Father has on the household is tremendous. And I want to show you what I found the other day. Whoops. There it is. Okay. So, this is the Father's influence on salvation. When a dad comes to Christ first, 93% of the families follow. This is from the Fatherhood Initiative program, the one we're doing in the fall, teaching dad, um, people, teaching fathers how to be dads, right? We'll be doing that in the fall. This is from them. 93%, if a dad comes to Christ first, 93% of his family will follow him. Of the 93% of the time, right? Oops. Moms, moms are great influencers. Don't get me wrong. Moms have, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of men here can say, you know, I had grandma pray for me. I had my mom pray for me. Yeah, right. But yeah, they'll tell you, yeah, it was later in life when I came to that understanding. But when dad has that influence, it's a higher percentage. This one here, the 3.5, you see mom is first. This is mom dragging dad to church, right? And that's what we see. Most of the churches today are filled with women. And dad kind of comes, ar comes al around with them. He's not really influenced by anything. He just comes with his wife to make her happy. Happy wife, happy home, right? So that's, that's what's going on there. Men, fathers, have a great influence on their families. And we see this twice already in the scriptures. With the Philippian jailer, right? His household came to faith because of him. And now here's this man, this dad. We're told that he himself believed, right? And that's John 4, 53 and 54. He himself believed in his entire, entire household. They came to faith. Why? Because of his, his influence. He himself believed in his entire household. So dad, you have a great influence. A great influence. I'm so happy that, to hear from... Um, Bryn? Bri Brian? Brenna. <laughs> Brennan, what he's doing with, with Ellie, encouraging. That is wonderful because that's what he should be doing. And because of his influence, he's influencing his child. Not just you, but influence, influencing the ch children too. That is, that is what God wants us to do as men, as fathers, as dads. To be doing this, having this influence over our family. A godly influence. 
This man had a need. He heard about Jesus. He sought out Jesus to fulfill that need that he thought he had. And at the end, his true need was fulfilled. Not only for him, but also those around him in his household. Because in the household back in these days, they're not just talking about his wife and kids, talking about his slaves and everyone that were under his roof. Now the question posed to you this morning, men and women of faith, can people see something different in you that would cause them to seek out Jesus in their time of need? And to dad, it's never too late for you to have that influence that you could have over your family. The only point that that influence can ever end is when you're no longer there. Guess what? Then it's too late. Praise God for the things he said before us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunities that you provide to us as fathers and men to influence our families, our households, our wife and children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you continually to use us, to guide us, to lead us to your glory, to glorify you with our lives in every aspect. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for just the people you lay in our lives to help guide us and lead us, that held us by the hand. As we see, and we're talking with about the children this morning with Paul, as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving us as you do and being there for us. Amen.